Hi. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging channel. Let me get all straightened up here. Uh, for those of you who got bored with watching the NFL playoff games, I think uh, I think Detroit is is still winning. But in any case, back to astrophotography and astronomy. Uh, we have Tim Martin here tonight, and I asked him if he wanted an introduction, and he said that he's a man that needs no introduction. So, Tim, you don't get any introduction tonight. You can introduce yourself. You can introduce yourself just in a couple minutes. Uh, before we do one other thing, just a quick note on the schedule. Normally we go to it. So I will share a screen. I will share a screen. Entire screen. And if you go to our site, the astroimagingchannel.org, you'll see our schedule is starting to fill up, which is really nice. Uh, next week, who do we have next? Next week we have next week we have Gordon. Gordon's actually here, and in a moment or so, I'll have him give you a brief synopsis of what he's going to present next week. But it's about the eclipse. Uh, the following week we have no show because it's Super Bowl, of course. And then we have Carlos uh, remote and on site imaging from Chile. Oh, that's got to be exciting. Chile has some great skies and targets that we don't see very often. John Talbot has been back after that. And John has been on a few times. He always gives an interesting uh, presentation. So please come for that. And after that, Salvatore is going to be here. You know Salvatore. He is the producer, the owner, and the programmer for astrobin.com, which I think all of us probably have a site at. And of course, anyone out there that would like to be on the Astro Imaging channel and wants to send us a note from our site, please do that and we'll contact you and we'll find a place. Let me stop sharing. And before we get to Tim, Tim, so Gordon, you want to just give us your elevator pitch for your presentation next week? Sure. Um, thank you for uh, allowing me to do the talk. What what happened was I just came across the video that Steve Zeigler did about his uh, experience with imaging two eclipses, and you know he's a photographer, so he got really into the computer scripting part of eclipse photography, which is fine. But I've been to six eclipses, or I've been to five, and and an annular, so I've been to six. And I'm kind of a completely manual guy. So I've been doing it manually since 2001 when I went to my first one. And I'm gonna talk about how to set up being an eclipse photographer if you're a complete novice and be successful at it without using a lot of computer gear, just doing it manually and using my app to help give you the cues of what to do and when. So that's going to be the gist of my talk. To be very detailed about how to set exposures and field of view and the timing. And uh, I think you'll enjoy it. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I, I appreciate the opportunity. And for those of us that are going to the eclipse, and I bet a lot of people out there already are, uh, the one thing to remember, no matter whether you're doing an automated system or the manual system that that Gordon's describing, don't miss the eclipse itself. It's a two, three, or four minute event uh, that you might only see once and you wanna make sure you're looking at that rather than fussing with a camera or a computer. Oh, cool, yeah, and glasses, yeah. We'll, and we're gonna have one more program on automated systems for the eclipse and actually maybe even a third after the whole thing is over when we bring someone that's had a, a lot of experience in going to eclipses. So I think that's all the introduction. Tim, the man that doesn't need an introduction, Martin, <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to you. So okay. please go ahead. Okay. Share my screen here. And I only don't need an introduction because I'm so obscure, not because I'm famous. But uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, it's very humbling to be, you know, sitting here with all you guys who are just 
fabulous at this. Um, I still consider myself very new to this, even though I've been doing it about four years. Uh, I've been doing it mostly badly for about four years, and hopefully I'm starting to get a little bit better. And that's kind of what my topic is tonight, is about all the various mistakes that I've made, and I've made a lot of them. Um, I'm going to go over 15 major ones, and, and there have been many, many more. And I've been able to work my way through them because I've had a little help from my friends. So just a little word of warning here. Uh, a lot of the references you see here, you probably won't get unless you're 50 years or 50 years old or older. So sorry for you to you young people. Um, I'm a geezer. So uh, Malcolm Gladwell has said that it takes about 10,000 hours to mas master a complex discipline. Our, Host Eric Coles here says it takes about 40,000 hours for a technical discipline, so that's probably closer to true. Based on that, um, I've got a ways to go. I've probably got about another 15 years to go, so uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, this little quote from Sir Winston Churchill kind of describes my entire life, but uh, particularly when it comes to astrophotography. And so uh, if anybody disagrees with what I'm saying or has questions or comments, please let us know and and I won't be offended in the least. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, I grew up in Canyon, Texas, home of Paladura Canyon. And uh, when I finished high school, my father, I talked to my father and told him that I wanted to go to MIT. And he said, son, you can go to whatever college you can afford. And so I went to West Texas State. And I'm a person who has two left thumbs. I'm not a handy person at all. I'll usually call someone to come in and change a light bulb for me. So the local contractors love me. So this has been quite a challenge for me dealing with astronomical gear and stuff. So a little bit about how I got interested in this. I grew up in the 1960s and was a huge fan of, of uh, the manned spaceflight program, Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, and just followed that um, very, very closely. I was totally captivated by it. And I, so I was an easy recruit to the uh, NASA conspiracy to convince people their stuff in space. Then in about second grade or so, we used to get these Nelson Doubleday Science Service Program booklets every few weeks in school, and, and they had the little pictures that you would um, punch out and paste into the book. And um, the one that really captivated my attention was the one on the lower right here that says universe on it. And in that booklet are these two pictures. Um, these were taken by the 200 inch Hale telescope at Mount Palomar in the 1950s. And I was just fascinated by those. And, and those, those two images right there still stick in my head to this very day. I followed Hubble and other things, but I never really owned a telescope until recently. Then in about 2016 or 2017, I started watching these two guys on YouTube, and that really piqued my interest. Um, I was very intimidated by what they were doing at first, but they, you know, really kind of helped me overcome it. And, and uh, um, so then I decided to take it a little step further. More recently, um, I've had a whole lot of help from this group of people and a lot of others, but mainly these guys, uh, Sean Nielsen and his Visible Dark channel. I always found his videos very informative and concise, easy to follow. And uh, then Ron Breacher, the Astro Doc, I've been taking private lessons from him for a while and he's, he's helped me the most. He's just been fabulous. And uh, then the third person there is Tolga, and I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this name correctly, Tolga Gumusayak um, of Tolga Astro, just a great uh, supplier of Astro gear. He's been a huge help to me and so knowledgeable, and, and I'll talk more about him a little later. And then the two guys there in the lower right are Peter Lipscomb and Lloyd Smith at Deep Sky West, where I have one telescope now, and I'll be placing two more there pretty soon. And then finally, there's this guy, my friend Nick Patridge, who started this thing with me. Um, he and his wife, Jess, were the only people that were allowed in our house during 
the COVID lockdown from outside. And so he and I spent a lot of time outside getting bitten by skeeters in the summer and freezing our globular clusters off in the winter time. And he really, you know, helped research these things and figure out the mechanics of doing it and and uh, was key in getting things set up and torn down and and he's he's a little more handy than I am, which is not saying much. So many thanks to all those people. Um, this was my first telescope. I got it in 2019, uh, the Apertura 12 inch daub, pretty basic telescope, but really had a good time looking through it and looking at the moon and some other objects, Orion and some other things. And then I decided to stick my phone up to the eyepiece and I took this picture. So this was my first astrophotography image. Um, took that in January of 2020 and really got hooked and decided, okay, I need to get a real telescope now. And then COVID happened. And so instead of injecting myself with bleach or ingesting horse dewormer, I decided I'd get a real telescope to occupy my nights during the lockdown. Um, and I probably bit off a little more than I could chew. My first real telescope was a Celestron Edge HD 1100. And I also got the Hyperstar attachment for it. I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but between Nick and I, we managed to get this thing put together and actually started taking a few pictures with it. These were my first two pictures with it. Um, M15 on the left, you probably can't tell that. It's pretty awful. And then the Pelican Nebula on the right, also pretty ter terrible too. And so that kind of leads me into the 15 big mistakes that, that I made early on and, and had to overcome um, to get to where I could actually enjoy doing this. And I even enjoyed working through the mistakes. I, I, like, I like problem solving, so that it's always helpful if you like problem solving, if you have a lot of problems. So my first mistake was getting a C11 as my first scope. Um, you know, part of my erroneous belief was that um, basically all telescopes were the same, it just boils down to money. But what really kicked my butt, aside from the things that you have to do with any telescope, like polar aligning and guiding and, and so forth, was um, how touchy the C11 and I guess SCTs in general are about things like back focus, you know, getting, getting it down to 146.05 millimeters was a challenge probably really took me about a year to get that completely right. And then the challenge of off-axis guiding, uh, I read early on that it would be no bueno to try to attach a, a big guide scope on top of it. And so I struggled with off-axis guiding and then there was collimation and then figuring out just how to work the mount. But probably the most difficult thing about it all was just how heavy that thing was and moving it inside and outside all the time it was just just really awful getting it in and out of the house all the time so the lesson i learned from that is that you should start with a small refractor when you're first starting this avocation it's uh, a lot easier there there it's more forgiving with a shorter focal length you're you don't have to worry about as much precision in your mount and your guiding and so forth and uh, so that's what I should have should have started with. And what I didn't really realize at the time was just how many wonderful targets there are out there for small refractors. Um, there, there are many huge objects in the night sky, and I'll I'll get to that in a minute. But um, it really does does pay to start smaller to to, to when you're first starting out. So. After a couple of years, I was able to, last summer, I went out with my small refractor. I have a, I had a Xenostar 61 William Optics, pretty cheap little doublet refractor, but it still did great, a great job for me, I thought. And uh, last summer I went out, I was able to get this shot of Ro Ophiuchi on a dark sky trip out to Kanab, Utah. So then that takes me to the second mistake, which is closely related. Um, I thought you needed a lot of magnification to get great astrophotos. And uh, boy, is that wrong. I mean, 
you know, you can 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 see a lot of huge objects in the sky. Um, I didn't realize that some of these objects were so large. I didn't even know what some of these objects were until I started doing this. And so uh, I always thought that I needed really heavy magnification, which was one of the things, one of the reasons that I decided to go with the C11 to start with. So um, some objects, of course, require a longer focal length, but there's so many great targets out there that you don't, don't need a long focal length for. So I guess the lesson from that is to find the right focal length for the, for the objects you want to shoot and, uh, and for the types of things you want to do. And I learned a lot about this from Ron Breacher. Um, getting a focal length that's appropriate for the targets and a camera to match it that's appropriate for the targets you want to shoot is pretty important. And you need to pay attention to things like image scale, which we'll talk a little bit about later, which I didn't know anything about at the time. And then watching people like um, Bray Falls and some of the others who just do fabulous mosaics really brought home to me the, the value of small refractors and what beautiful wide fields they could do. Um, I, lear I learned how to create mosaics and I tried it with the C11, but I never really got it to work very well with the C11. I guess my data just wasn't very good at the time and it, I wasn't able to stitch the mosaics together. But um, I was able to overcome that with a small Cena star refractor. So bottom line here is if you want to shoot targets of various shapes and sizes, you may need more than one telescope. And, and as Ron tells me, you can never have too many of them. So here's just a little example. This was shot with a small refractor, the Zenith Star 61. Um, M16 and M17, they all fit in one frame on, a, uh, on an APS-C sensor. And then this was shot with uh, TOA 130 at, at a much longer focal length at 990 millimeters. So you get a little closer in there, but you lose a little bit of the context as well. And then this was shot at 2800 millimeters with a with the C11. And these shots are, are probably a couple of years old. So mistake number three was setting up and tearing down before and after every session. Um, it seemed really stupid to me to leave tens of thousands of dollars of photography equipment outside. Um, living in Dallas, we often have summers where it stays above 100 degrees for weeks at a time. And we get some nasty thunderstorms with hail and wind and so on. And, and then, of course, people farther north have to contend with really cold temperatures. It does get somewhat cold here sometimes. We had uh, we got down to one degree above zero Fahrenheit here a couple of weeks ago. So it can get fairly cold here, but not the brutal bitter cold that you can get up north. So setting up and tearing down after every session might not be so bad with a small scope. With a C11 and a 65-year-old back, it was just brutal. And also that opened opened me up to my weakness in dealing with mechanical things. And, and uh, um, one night I managed to pull this off. Uh, I had set up the tripod and had only loosely tightened down the clamps while I was leveling it and meant to tighten them down before I put everything on there. And of course I forgot to do that. So I put the mount and the scope and everything else on top of it and thought I was good to go. Uh, and I sat there for several hours until it got dark. And then I was sitting there polar aligning, was about to polar align and I was looking at the screen and the stars just started drifting slowly across the screen. And when I looked up, that's what I saw was that telescope laying on its side. And I, I have this astronomy pad next to my house that's raised up about 12 inches. And I got lucky. The tube of the scope hit the edge of that pad and absorbed all the shock and I didn't lose any glass. No glass was broken. So I was able to send this off to Celestron and they repaired it for 175 bucks. But lesson learned. So then I started looking into what can I do to avoid this situation in the future and 
um, discovered what thousands of people already knew is that there was a thing called telegismos covers out there and they were a revelation to me. Um, I also looked into doing a roll off roof or some domes or something next to the house, but the HOA was very uncooperative with that. If, if I was going to build any kind of building next to my house, it had to look just like my house. It had to have windows. It had to be plumbed for a bathroom. And so that was not really doable. Um, so the Telegismos covers were perfect. And now I've left my scopes outside for about two years and haven't had any problems with it. I've seen people talk about how that can cause your gear to age or wear prematurely, but haven't really experienced that. And my feeling is nothing is going to cause your equipment to age prematurely, like slamming it into your astronomy pad. So um, I figure I'm better off regardless. And as far as I know, I haven't had any kind of equipment failure as a result of leaving it outside all this time. If there's going to be really something horrible going on, then, then I will tear it down and bring it in. But I think I've done that maybe two times. So also that really facilitates, that really made this a much more pleasant activity because then I didn't have to dread doing that taking that gear out there and setting it up all the time, I, you know, it was ready to go. All I had to do was turn everything on and hook up to it and I was good to go. So that really enabled me to do a lot more work and, and get a lot more exposure time. And this image, for example, is 125 hours. It's a four panel mosaic, 125 hours. I never would have been able to take this image if I was still lugging equipment in and out all the time. Um, the next thing that I really didn't do very well was uh, I didn't really understand how flats worked or when I really needed to take them. And they were really the bane of my existence for a long time. I, I thought you had to do it after every session and uh, I thought it needed to be done at the end of the session. These were the things that I had heard online. And so that's what I was doing. And I was going out at 5 a.m. in the morning every morning to take flats, unless I overslept. And then then I was kind of then I was kind of out of luck. Um, and I did this by hand. And by that I mean I was using a cheap tracing panel from Amazon and uh, just pointing the, the scope straight up and doing it that way. And that didn't produce very good results a lot of the time. And I wasn't really familiar with how to use things like the Flat Wizard and Nina. And, and so um, I did, didn't take flats very well. And uh, other than lugging gear in and out of the house all the time, this was the thing that almost terminated my interest in astrophotography. But fortunately, after talking with Ron about all this many times, uh, I've learned a little bit more about how it really works. And now I only take flats when I need to, whether it's before or after a session really doesn't matter. And it doesn't seem to matter if you haven't changed anything in your image train, you may not need to take flats again. Now, these days, I only take flats about every four to six weeks. So it's not something I do all the time. And I only do it when I see something that's not being corrected in the subs that I'm getting. And, and then I say, okay, it's time to take some flats. And with it pretty well automated in Nina, it's pretty painless these days. So the other thing is, is, um, you know, moving from one shot color to mono and having more of a sealed environment for my image train really facilitated this. When I was using a one shot color camera and a filter drawer, I could have used a filter wheel with a one shot camera, but I, I wasn't that smart. I didn't figure that out for a while. But uh, using a filter drawer that allows dust motes to come in all the time. So you really do have to take flats quite a bit if that's what you're doing, or at least I did. But with a sealed image train, that makes a lot of difference in, and uh, reduces the need to take flats all the time. Um, and also I've noticed that if my light cone is really well centered on the sensor, then I don't really even need to take flats when I do a rotation. 
So that's been a real boon to me and has really made me enjoy this hobby a whole lot more that not having to do that drudgery, not having to go out in the morning, not having to deal with flats and all those files and take them once every few weeks. I, I stack the masters and then just reuse the masters over and over again. Here's a little example of that. This is a two panel mosaic I took in November and December with the TOA um, and the, the, the images were finished about a month apart and they both used the same flats. The next mistake I was engaged in early on is closely related. Using a cheap tracing panel for Amazon to take flats. I didn't really realize how much that was not working for me and how many problems it was causing for me. You can see this image here that I'm showing on the screen is a four panel mosaic of M31 that I took on a dark sky trip. And when I stacked it, this is what I got. And until just a few months ago, I didn't know what was causing it to look so horrible. I thought it was a camera malfunction. And then Ron alerted me to the fact that it was probably the flats. And he showed me a way to make synthetic flats and, and go ahead and process that. And fortunately, I, there weren't a lot of dust motes or, or vignetting issues to deal with on this data. So um, I was able to salvage it pretty well a couple of years after the fact. But uh, a tracing panel is really hard to use because shooting at F10 with multiple filters, you, you need a certain brightness with the luminance filter and it needs to be much brighter with a sulfur filter. And so that was a really difficult thing to do by hand um, with a tracing panel that wasn't really made to do what I was trying to do with it. So I tried all kinds of different other flat panels and and they work to varying degrees, but the best one, the best ones that I've been using recently are the Spica flat. And sadly, Spica has gone out of business. I think there's a place where you can still get them, but I'm not sure about that. And then I've been on my TOA, I've been using the um, PLL Alto and Giotto, and which is very nice for remote automation because you can use it as a cover too. Um, one thing I like about using it as a cover is that when it's open, it rotates 270 degrees. A lot of the, the flat panel cover combos that I've seen just rotate 90 degrees and stick out and become a wind sail on your scope. So this one at least rotates back 270 degrees and sits under the OTA or sits on top of it and is, is pretty much out of the way. And it delivers a really good um, flat field and has a great variation in brightness. So it's really easy to get the level of brightness you need for, for all the filters in your filter wheel. And so with what Ron showed me, I was able to take that same data from like three years ago and turn it into that. Another mistake I made was that I thought you really only needed to shoot for about three hours to get a good picture of just about anything. And boy, was that ever wrong. <laughs> and I think that got that notion from some of the more basic beginner oriented YouTube channels. But that's really what I thought until I started getting on Astrobin and seeing people who were exposing targets for dozens and dozens of hours and then realized that why they were doing it is because they were trying to pull out more detail and get, getting more signal and, and uh, um, trying to get more um, contrast and variation and depth in their pictures. It's you can get some great pictures in just a few hours sometimes, especially if you're under a dark sky, but more integration time is always better. Here's a shot I took of M15 two and a half years ago, and I was very happy with this shot. I took it with a C11. And I was very happy with this shot, um, but as we'll see in a minute, I was missing out on a whole lot and didn't even know it. I just thought M15 and sitting out there by itself in the darkness of space. 
but there's really a lot going around the, going on around this thing that I didn't realize was going on. So the lesson here is to get as much in integration time as you can. It's not a race. I want to get good pictures. I, I, I don't want to get lots of pictures necessarily. I just want to get good pictures. And we have a lot of great tools these days to help us with that between noise exterminator and blur exterminator and Braxbird and all these things. But in the end, we still need the signal to work with. And so it just takes more time to increase that sig signal to noise ratio. There is, however, a point of diminishing returns. And this was something that I learned along the way, uh, mostly from Ron, is that to really increase the signal to noise ratio, you have to double the, the integration time. And so once, once I get to about 25 or 30 hours, I'm thinking, well, do I want to go 50 to 60 hours or more on this? For some targets, that's necessary. And for others, it, it doesn't really yield a whole lot extra. So it's finding that balance between not missing out on some great stuff that's there and, and maybe going unnecessarily long on the target. So this picture is one that I took last fall of M15 with 32 hours of integration time. And granted, it's taking a little faster scope at f7 um, but uh, there's a whole lot of stuff going on here that i had no idea was going on there and so it was really cool to see this happen with a little more time my next mistake was trying to take pictures of faint broadband targets from my borderland i live in north dallas and we have a lot of light pollution here. And right as I started doing astrophotography, I thought Jerry Jones just had it in for me personally. Because right after I started, he built the star, this multi-billion dollar Dallas Cowboys practice facility with hotels and shops and restaurants about two miles from my house. And it's got about 50 huge outdoor TV screens. One of them is about 40 yards wide. And it just gives off a massive amount of light and pretty much ruins the whole northeastern region of my sky. Not that it was great to begin with, but it's even worse now. So I attempted to, to shoot some of these faint things, but never got very far with it. Um, I, I think I got some, what I thought at the time, and, and still think are some fairly passable pictures of galaxies and globular clusters. Um, it's pretty hard to get any faint, dusty stuff in a Bortle 8 or a Bortle 9. So the, the lesson there is to get to a dark sky or just stick with narrowband. Um, I've been on several dark sky trips, and I really enjoy doing that. And I've gotten, you know, some shots that I could never get here at home. But going on dark sky trips is not all that convenient, necessarily. Um, fortunately for me, my wife loves to camp and travel. We have an RV, and so I have opportunities to do it. But when that's the main purpose of your trip, it's, you know, how often can you do that? So ultimately, I decided to go with some remote hosting because I, I really enjoyed the, the pictures that I was getting on these dark sky trips and, and having scopes out at deep sky west has really kind of changed my astrophotography life because now i have telescopes under dark sky all the time which is just fabulous and it's opened up dozens if not hundreds of new targets to me so here's a little example of some of the data i tried to get from here at home this is Markarian's chain um, this is about 20 hours it's the um, RGB master for a one-shot color camera and uh, those gradients are just impossible uh, you know you can DBE will do so much and we we'll only do so much with it and then if you really want to get rid of it you have to do things that are illegal in about 22 states so it's just not worth it compared that to um, this recent luminance master that I took of M33 
at Deep Sky West. There's a gradient there, but it's pretty simple to eradicate. It's uh, you know pretty straightforward going from the bottom to top. So pretty easy to eliminate. On the other hand, um, I always felt I was getting some pretty decent results with narrow band under a Bortal 8. Uh, this is one of my favorite narrow band images that I've taken of the bubble nebula. Um, and so I felt like a really narrow band is probably what I should focus on here at home. And then here's a shot that I got on a dark sky trip at to the Nightfall Star Party in Borrego Springs in 2022. So next mistake was sticking with one shot color cameras for too long. Um, um, again, I was just intimidated by going to mono because you had all these filters and they're expensive and you gotta have a filter wheel and it complicates the sequencing and data gathering and data management and stacking and processing and all that. So I was just really a, um, a bit fearful of jumping into all that. And, and uh, so I tried using multi narrow band filters at home but you know it was always up against the fact that i couldn't separate the hydrogen alpha from the sulfur too and so i could never get results with the one shot color camera that i was really pleased with or that matched what i was seeing people get out of out of mono cameras and also it's just the fact that you're not really utilizing the entire sensor for every band band that you're shooting is a problem so i wanted to to go to mono but i really didn't know how and again you know ron really helped me get over my fear of that and helped me work through that and showed me how to handle processing all those those types of images and of course i learned that mono is a huge improvement at least for me over one shot color because every pixel gets illuminated and um, i've got more control over what kind of bandwidth I want, even on my narrow band filters. Uh, I'm using three nanometer filters. I know Lloyd at Deep Sky West, he says he wants all the light. And so he uses seven or 12 nanometer filters out there into that dark sky. Um, I'm, I'm a bit reticent to do that, but I had really good luck with three nanometer filters here in North Dallas. And, uh, and so here's a couple of examples of that. Um, this is M51 shot with a one co shot color camera from here. This is about 20 hours. And then this is about um, 40 hours shot with uh, monochrome here in this Bortle 8. So I think that's a, a big improvement over the one shot color version. <laughs> Another mistake that I made was not trying to learn the the really good software early on, um, learning Nina and PixInsight or some other more advanced tool. I started with astrophotography tool. It's fine. I learned a lot of things. I don't want to denigrate it in any way, but um, I learned a lot of things with it. I learned the basics of sequencing and, and uh, capturing images and storing images and and managing the data and all that. And then I used Deep St Sky Stacker for a while, not terribly long, because with that C11, my data was so terrible that there were uh, there were images that Deep Sky Stacker just wouldn't stack. So that's when I found AstroPixel Processor and started using that for stacking. And I actually still use that today over WBPP. I personally think I get better results out of it. Um, Many people may disagree with that, but I seem to get better results out of it. And and maybe it's because I haven't applied myself correctly to WBPP. Um, one of the impediments to that is that when I have multiple images and I need to stack one and I need to process one, I don't want to tie up PixInsight stacking while I could be processing another image. So that's kind of been an impediment to that. But uh, I think the lesson here is to figure out how to how to use a good piece of capture software and, and good post-processing software as soon as you can. Um, 
I know Nina and SGP and Voyager seem to be the platforms that most of the accomplished astrophotographers use. Um, these, of course, were, again, were all very intimidating to me at first, um, SGP and Voyager especially. So I landed on Nina because I saw some videos that Sean Nielsen did on it, and it seemed like, oh, I can figure this out. And so I was able to get over the hump on that by watching some of his tutorials. I mean, I've seen recent analysis that compare some of the features and functions of Voyager and Nina, and while Voyager still seems to be state of the art, it does look like Nina is catching up a bit. And with Ron's help, I was able to put together sequences that work really well for me at remote site too. So I use it both here at home and remotely as well. And Sean also kind of got me over the initial hump with PixInsight, where I could start using it and start taking advantage of some of the things that it had to offer. But it was really my first session with Ron Breacher in May of 2021 that opened my eyes. Uh, within two hours, he demystified PixInsight for me and changed my astrophotography experience for the better forever. Um, about a thousand light bulbs turned on in my head during that first two hours. And uh, I continue to do sessions with Ron to this day. I'll probably do 10 to 20 hours a year with Ron until the day I die. I don't think that's necessary for everybody to do that much, but um, do a lot of things with him these days in terms of strategy and planning and things like that. He's very helpful. He's been very helpful with gear acquisition and you know, the things that I need, the things that I should be doing. And he's always keeping me up to date on the latest, greatest techniques and processes um, in PixInsight. So today I use Nina for capture, APP for most stacking pro projects, and PixInsight for post and Photoshop for some fine finishing work, usually just some curves and saturation and contrast. Uh, Tim? Yes, sir. I don't, I don't see any questions out here, but I might have missed one. Do you want to tell us what gear you have out at Deep Sky West? So currently I have um, Takahashi TOA 130, and uh, it has a Moravian C5A 100 on it. It's got the huge medium format sensor on it, and it's a fabulous combination. I use chroma filters on that three nanometer filters and then i have a 10 micron gm 2000 that that's sitting on um i am currently building if if you if you could see me you can see behind me there is an fsq 106 and i'm almost it's almost ready to go out to um deep sky west i just need to do a little bit of cable management and plug all the stuff into the enclosure that'll sit behind it and that'll be ready to go and then if you could see my floor over here to my left, you would see a CDK-12. That's headed out there, too. Um, I'll start building that out next week. And it took over a year to get all this stuff. You know, it's not just getting the telescope. It's getting the mount. It's getting all the accessories, the cameras. The, the Moravian C5 is a brand new camera, and, and it was pretty hard to get. Um, the FSQ-106 took a year to get. So uh, so the uh, the 106, is that going to be on a, a GM-1000? That'll be on a GM-1000. That's what I've got it on right here. And, and the CDK? It will be on another GM-2000. Thank you. I hope that's enough. You think that's enough? Uh, he who dies with the most toys wins. <laughs> no, I mean, as far as, is that enough mount for a CDK-12? Because Oh, has... I'm sorry. I thought you were asking, is that enough <laughs> astrophotography <laughs> equipment? <laughs> no, and I still have my C11, and I'll use it here at home for visual and planetary photography, but just, just for visual and planetary. Yeah, people are always coming over here and saying, can I look through your telescope? And I'm like, well, it's got like two feet of camera stuff on the back of it, so no. Um, but I'm, I'm sure the 2000 will carry the, the small CDK fine. I hope so. Yeah. 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 I wanted to, you know, I wanted the three different focal lengths, but I didn't want to bite. I 
could have gotten a CDK 17 or larger, but I didn't want to make that same mistake again and bite off more than I can chew. So the we'll see we'll see how that goes. And then I have a Red Cat 71 that I use that I take with me in the RV. Is that it? Anything else? Uh, I don't see any more questions. Okay. Very good. Uh, Very good. So I've had that TOA out of Deep Sky West since July. All right. So back to this again. I just I wanted to show you a few images just to compare. This was one that I took with the C11 on a trip to Big Bend in late 2020 uh, with a one-shot color camera. Uh, this was all the post processing. Everything was done with Astro Pixel processor. You can actually do that in there. It's not easy, and it's not at least when I use it, it's not great. Um, but you can do it, and that was done that way. And then after my lessons with Ron, I took that same data and reprocessed it and got this. I think that's a little better result. And similarly, um, this is NGC two four seven taken on the same trip. One shot color, C11, 2800 millimeters. And then here's the after Ron picture. I don't really have any comparable, you know, same data narrow band things that I can show you. But I did this is one narrow band picture I took early on at the Pelican Nebula. And this is one that I took more recently after working with Ron. And here's a Malat 15 that I took early on, and then a more recent one. So hopefully I'm improving. Another thing I really didn't understand was pixel scale. And so I didn't understand seeing, I didn't understand pixel scale pixel scale and and uh, uh, both Ron and and um, going to the masters of Pix insight have been has been very illuminating on that uh, Sean Nielsen has done some um, work on that I think Dylan has even done some work on that that's helped me through that um, but um, things like undersampling oversampling and paying attention to seeing are kind of important so just in case anyone doesn't know, and I hate to be pedantic, and I, I don't want to uh, overstate the obvious here. It seems like most people know a lot of this stuff that I'm talking to here in this audience, but um, undersampling will typically produce square stars because the star is not enough to, the pixels are so small that, um, I'm sorry, the pixels are so large that a star doesn't go beyond one pixel. So you're gonna get some square stars and probably some blocky look to the rest of your image as well. You can fix that with drizzling to some degree and then oversampling results in bloated stars. And because the, the stars overflow into too many pixels. So similarly, you're gonna get a, a blurrier picture and a blurrier image and and a more bloated star image out of oversampling. And so looking at pixel scale and, and looking at the, the typical scene you have in your area is kind of important. Um, you want to try to hit a pixel scale uh, between 0.67 and 2.0 arc seconds per pixel. Assuming average seeing, um, then um, that pixel scale those pixel scales should should be where you are. Um, binning, I have used some, but uh, I've I've been seeing I think from Robin Glover and and even Warren Keller has talked about this sometimes, and so I'm I'm still a little fuzzy on it. But and Ron has always recommended binning when I'm shooting with a C11 at full focal length. On the other hand, I saw an interview that Russ Croman did with Sean Nielsen where he was talking about if the point spread function of your image is greater than eight, then you can downsample at 50% and not lose any detail. 
it's less than eight, then you don't want to downsample it. And this is why he limited a blur exterminator to a PSF of eight. So I've been looking at my images past and present in that context. And there are some times when I shoot at 2,800 millimeters and my PSF is less than eight. There are many times though, when I shoot at 2,800 millimeters and my PSF is greater than eight. So would I have been better off binning? I don't know, because that, that seems to be kind of fuzzy for me too. And that is binning on a CMOS any better than just resampling after you've captured the data. It doesn't seem to me to be much different because the, the binning combination is occurring essentially in software, it may be firmware, but it's still a software, al software algorithm that's doing the binning rather than CCD style binning where the pixels actually got married together physically or electronically in a sense so that that uh, you're getting a true count of the photons that are hitting that square of four pixels whereas with cmos you're getting an average of what pixels hit each of the four pixels or what photons hit each of the four pixels so i'm still a little bit fuzzy about that so i still haven't adventured too much into binning um, i've done drizzling on my small refractor image images that that seems to work okay. So I don't know. Um, I do know that pixel scale does matter. And it probably what I'm seeing in, you know, having some images with a higher point spread function and a lower point spread function, it's just a function of the seeing that I'm getting wherever, you know, whenever I'm shooting. So I don't know for sure. I, I don't have that expertise yet. Um, but this is an M78 I shot at the Nightfall Star Party again um, with a C11 with 3.76 micron pixels. And I shot this with the reducer at 1960 millimeters. But this next one I just recently shot at Deep Sky West with uh, the TOA 130, same pixel size, 3.76 microns but at 990 millimeters instead of 1960. So this is at a pixel scale of 0.782 versus a pixel scale of 0.4. Yet to me, this image looks like it has darn near as much detail as the other one did. I'll go back and forth a time or two. Maybe I'm just bad at focusing and so they're both each as blurry, but I just seem to see about the same amount of detail in each of these pictures. Perhaps a little more detail in this picture from the C11. So I'm really not sure what that, that additional thousand millimeters of focal length was getting me there other than just limiting my field of view. So next thing up here is uh, has to do with sub length, and uh, this ties into a talk that I saw Robin Glover give that was posted the to the Astrofarsography YouTube channel, where he, he talked for about an hour about sub exposure length and gain and read noise and shot noise and so on. But he essentially said with the reduced read, what I get out of it was with the reduced read noise available in CMOS sensors and the reduced dark pattern current in CMOS sensors, the reduced amp glow of newer CMOS sensors, um, it makes sense to take more shorter subs than fewer longer subs. And my experience here in Dallas kind of reinforced that. And, and uh, I think there was a, there was someone on the Astro Imaging channel, Richard Wright, who did a talk about the end of guiding. And he talked about this as well as going with shorter and shorter subs rather than longer and longer subs. Um, this was an advantage for me. I, you know, I was first started off trying to do 10 minute subs. And I was just having to throw out about half of them because of low flying airplanes. I live eight miles from DFW airport, which is the second busiest airport in the world. 
and I guess 737s flying over me at 2,000, 3,000 feet all the time. And I can sigma clip out satellites, but it's kind of tough to sigma clip out an airplane engine. So um, this resonated with me. So after I saw that talk, I started shortening my subs and I still had to throw out a significant amount of data depending on the target and the time of day or night because the airport closes, I think, at 11. And so after that, everything's okay. But before that, I was throwing, it was throwing out a lot of data. I have, I have a new attendee. And uh, so that resonated with me. And we get a lot of gusty winds around here too that can affect guiding and so forth. And so I would be throwing out a lot of subs for that. So I did some experiments with it. I don't know that they were conclusive, but they were somewhat informative. Um, I was trying with a one-shot color camera to shoot the squid, the flying bat and squid, trying to get the squid with a one-shot color camera from a Bortle 8. Um, don't waste your time on it. It's impossible. <laughs> but this is six hours of 180-second subs with signal-to-noise ratios of 35, 42, and 37. Then with 10-minute subs, also six hours worth, you see the signal to noise ratios drop by two to five percent. So that's, I assume, the accumulation of sky glow. So I just pretty much permanently went to, here at home, I went to 180 seconds for narrow band and 60 second subs for broadband. There's cost to that. It's, it's a, uh, a lot more data to manage and it takes up a lot more space and stacking takes forever and you may be piling up more read noise although i think both dr glover and richard wright said that that is negligible that has a negligible effect i don't know I'm not an expert on that but that's what they were saying um, but it does reduce the impact of any risks such as guiding errors or or low flying airplanes or wind gusts or things of that na nature. And it also gives the stacking algorithms more data to chew on. Here's just a little uh, thing I did. I was I spent 30 hours on the Seagull and uh, had to throw out 53 180 second subs because of airplane strikes. And then I just decided for fun, I would just stack those only and turn off um, any rejection algorithms. and. This is what I got. Um, if I had been shooting 600 second subs, instead of throwing out three out of 30 hours, I might have thrown out as much as 10 out of 30 hours. This next one is probably a little more aesthetic. As I, as I got more confident with the technical aspects of capture and processing and so forth, um, my wife started talking to me about trying to be a little bit more artistic with the framing and so forth. And so I make no claim to be a scientist. Um, the, the, the only actual science I might produce would be purely an accident. I know some very smart amateurs who are taking spectros and discovering new planetary nebulas and discovering and tracking asteroids, but I'm not one of those people yet. The most attainable goal I can shoot for in, in, for any contribution to science is just to inspire other people to learn about and think about the reality that exists above our heads. And so to do that, I want to try to reach other people with my images and framing can be a help with that. Here's a little example. I could have just, I shot M34 and I could have just plopped it in the middle of the frame, but I noticed that there was a, a cool looking tiny little galaxy in the sky survey is not too far from it. So I decided to try to get them both in there. And what surprised me was how many other just jillions of little galaxies there are and, and, and how much more interesting this image is since I framed it this way. I've also been kind of experimenting with shooting HA and O3 on targets that typically 
most people don't shoot it on just to see if there's anything there. And if it looks like there's something there, then I'll continue on and shoot more HA and O3 and see if it can add anything informative to the image. So I thought that was pretty fruitful on this particular image. So one of the lessons here, I think, is to learn from artists regarding framing and be more sensitive to framing. Now, I'm not an artist, but there's this girl in my house who for the past 40 years has been letting me sleep with her if I pay for her art supplies. So I've studied how she and her friends work and, and often consult with her about how I should frame a particular target. And she always reminds me of the rule of the thirds and of the golden ratio. So I try to follow those things when I can. It's not always possible because the shape of the target you're shooting or maybe the other objects you want to capture in the frame really put constraints on it. But I think it's still a good thing to try to keep in mind when you're framing targets, when you can, if you want to create something aesthetically pleasing. Um, to me, you know, when I'm shooting something that has been shot many times before, which is almost everything I shoot, I try to study award-winning pictures and see, you know, see what worked for for those photographers and, and see if I can figure out, besides the processing and the technical details, what made this picture appeal to a large number of people. Excuse me. So, uh, so to get there, I kind of started doing rotations by hand. And uh, that's a pain in the rear because I would have to go outside multiple times. You have to rotate it a little bit, take a picture, go in and look and see how much farther I needed to rotate it, go back outside and do that, and so on and so forth. So I finally wised up and got a real rotator for the scope. I think it's an essential tool for doing framing and especially for doing things like mosaics. Um, I think it's essential. So here's an example. Um, this is a, a shot that I really worked hard to, to frame using the golden ratio. And I think it worked out pretty well. Um, I, I kind of like the way the main target draws your focus, but then your eye is drawn perhaps to the dusty lanes on the left side and the little galaxies adjacent to that. Um, if you draw out the golden ratio on top of it, it looks like this. And so I've followed that on a number of different images that I've shot. Here's one of NGC 2170. It's a very similar framing. Same thing here. And then as to framing mosaics, um, kind of going back to, I mentioned that, going back to framing mosaics, um, if you don't employ a rotator or rotation in mosaic framing and you're anywhere near the pole, this is what you're gonna get. You're gonna get frames that are all field rotated all around the center of the, the mosaic. And that's very costly because um, you're wasting a lot of space there. You're going to be shooting a lot of stuff you don't need. You're going to be shooting a lot of stuff twice that you don't need to shoot twice. It's going to be harder to frame the image in general, especially if you try to apply any overall rotation to it. So uh, that's one thing I think makes a rotator really necessary. If, however, you use Nina's little... Um, little function to preserve alignment. So this particular mosaic I'm trying to frame, I'm sorry, I'm backing up a little bit. This particular mosaic I'm trying to frame from NGC 7822 down to the Lion Nebula and over to um, OU4, the squid. So this is taking 25 frames to get that with this particular camera and focal length. But if I have a rotator and I use Nina's preserve alignment function, I can get that in 16 panels instead of 25. So it's a savings of nine panels. That's pretty good. Um, that's, that's more than a third of 
of of the time that you're going to save to do this particular mosaic and it also makes it a little easier to frame it makes it easier to rotate the entire mosaic if you want to and and so i really highly recommend employing a rotator for framing whether it's single frames or for mosaics here's one i'm currently working on um, and one of the things that I'm, I try to do in mosaics is frame as many of the panels so that they turn out to be decent single shots as well. So here you can see I've got Flaming Star pretty much enclosed in one panel, Tadpoles pretty much enclosed in one panel, Spider and Fly in one panel, Great Pumpkin in one panel, and what I call the Gripping Hand in one panel. Here's, uh, I've got four of them done. Um, only three of them are, are worth showing. But here's the spider and fly panel and then the great pumpkin panel. And then the gripping hand panel. Uh, the, this, this one doesn't have a name and um, there, are, there is a designation for it. I forget what it is. It's a LBM designation. I can't remember what it is. And then that's um that is m38 um one misconception i had was that your pictures have to represent what objects would look like to the naked eye up close like is is lowers nebula really red Right, Eric? Um, and so uh, I don't know what these objects would look like if I was looking at them up close with the naked eye. I know when I looked through my Dobsonian at the Orion Nebula, it was a gray blob. It had no color at all. So I have no idea what color this stuff would be if I was up close and how close. A light year, 100 light years, a million light years. I don't know. So Again, I'm not a scientist, and I'm not trying to preserve spectra in these images. What I want to try to get, though, is something that's authentic, and uh, and something something that really represents the object and the structure and the relationships in the object. So again, any any scientific contribution I might make is purely ancillary, and and uh, and is mainly there to try to get other people to think about astronomy in the universe and what's going on in it. So here's an image of M33 that I took recently. We looked at the luminance master earlier. Um, is this what it really looks like? I've added HOO here. Is this really what it looks like? What, is, what does it even mean, really looks like? To a human eyeball, which is a terrible receptor of light, I don't know. It's probably not what it looks like, but I hope it's an authentic representation. I hope it shows the relationships and the structures that are in this galaxy. So that's what I'm striving for. And that's kind of my lesson is to strive for authenticity, but embrace beauty of these objects. I don't think we could see most of these things with our naked eye if we were right next to them, or many of these things anyway. Um, I can walk outside right now and I can't see the Milky Way, even if it were summer and it was high in the sky, I wouldn't be able to see it here in Dallas. And even under a dark sky, when I look at the Milky Way, I can't see much color there. So, for example, with this particular shot of the Soul Nebula, is, is this what it looks like? Eh, no, I'm sure it's not. But is it a fair representation of the structure and the relationships in this? I hope so. Um, I know one of the importances of this particular nebula is its contribution to the theory of stellar formation because the stars in the center of the nebula were found to be older than the stars around the edges, leading to support for the theory that the radiation from those stars is compressing those gases around the edges and causing them to collapse and form new stars. So does this image help express that? I think so. I hope so.
So that brings me to the next one. And uh, it has to do with, is there anything unique? Can we do anything unique? Um, here's the old quote from Ecclesiastics, Ecclesiastes about how there's nothing new under the sun. But is there, can we find anything new? Um, it took me a while, but but I decided that I would try to find something unique. You know, we see these objects, same objects overhead all the time. And I like to revisit them and I, and I enjoy shooting some of the same ones over and over again every year. But I'm also um, trying to look for new ways to experience the night sky. Here's kind of what I think are some greatest hits of the night sky. Um, I always refer to M31 as the stairway to heaven of astrophotography and the Orion Nebula as the don't stop believing. These are some beautiful objects and wonderful ob objects, but are there some unconventional things that we can do? And just recently, Eric, host Eric Coles, our host, posted a, an image to Astrobin of the continuum subtracted HA core of Andromeda. And I thought that was one of the coolest things I had ever seen. It's still one of my favorite images of all time. And I just happened to be shooting M31 at the time. So I thought, well, hey, I'll try this with all three filters. And I, probably someone else has done that. I don't know, but I had never seen it done before. And so I gave it a shot and and uh, I think it came out pretty neat. Um, this is a GIF that, that switches between the broadband and the continuum subtracted narrow band that I processed with the four ax palette. And I think it reveals some, some pretty cool information about the core of Andromeda, and as, as did Eric's picture. I think Eric's picture is probably higher quality, but but uh, I think this one's pretty cool too. And uh, so, and, and as I mentioned before, I like to try to shoot some, maybe some HA and O3 on things that are traditionally broadband targets, just to see if there's anything there, anything interesting going on, anything that might add to the image. And then uh, occasionally, uh, two or three times a year, I engage in what I call a FAFO project, a fool around and find out project, where I just find a place on the sky survey that's pretty empty and point my telescope at it. So here, here are a few of the places where I've experimented. Um, this was a shot of M39. I had seen in, in wide fields, like from the cocoon to M39, I had seen it in wide fields and knew there was a lot of dust around there. So I decided to go for that. And I think this is about 35 hours on M39 and with HA added. And there's some interesting things going on in there. I had no idea. Um, this is one where uh, I just, I found a spot in the sky survey north of Roofuchi. And it looked like there might be a little nebulosity in there. And so I pointed my scope at it. I didn't see any named objects in the sky surveys on it, but it turns out this is SH227. And uh, just shot a two panel mosaic of that with my small refractor. And then I noticed that this, this star with the shock wave in front of it, researched that a little bit and found out that's Zeta Ophiuchi, a runaway star looked around on Astrobin to see if anybody had shot anything up close with it and I couldn't find anything. And so I spent quite a bit of time shooting it with a C11 up close. And this was my first image of the day on Astrobin. I actually shot SH and O, all three, but the S2, um, the S2 data was just a mess. The, the reflections from that bright star were horrible. And so I couldn't really use the S2 data, but, um, the HA and O3 data were okay. There's still some reflections in O3, but they were okay. And so I was able to put this image together. And as far as I know, this was the first long focal length image of this runaway star um, taken from the ground. I can't find any anywhere else. Um, and, you know, there may be other, you know, other images of this out there. The only close up image I've seen of it is uh, one that was taken with the Spitzer Space Telescope. I think it was re recently an APOD, but that picture's been around for a while. And then here's one where I pointed the scope at a, 
at an area that well, the only thing I could find in it was Colander 463, and I, I shot HA for 73 hours and it eh, kind of came up empty. Uh, so this one was kind of a bust, but it, you know, it was still interesting to do. And finally, we are almost done here. Oh, I was just going to ask, do you have uh, many more slides? Uh, three more slides. Okay, thanks. Okay. Just about done. Um, so the last error was not finding a great vendor to work with early on. And uh, I'll just cut to the chase. I, you know, I, I bought a lot of stuff on the various online vendors. And a lot of times I didn't know what I was buying and I didn't know what I was actually getting and wound up getting the wrong thing. And so here's a picture of my office, my garage and my guest room closet. And it's filled with what I call Yaffas, yet another effing adapter. And uh, and so my recommendation is to try to find a good vendor who's committed to, if you're committed to this and who's gonna give you great service and and make sure you get what you need and, and not more than what you need and not things you don't need. And the guy I found is Tolga, Tolga Astro, and he's just been wonderful to work with. Um, experienced, knowledgeable, um, ethical, and, and just great to work with. And he's really helped me get these scopes placed remotely so that's it well thanks Tim yeah that, that was interesting I especially like pointing the uh, telescope at some place that you know perhaps people haven't paid any attention to uh, I only saw one question out there and I think you answered it before that you use a reducer sometimes or always on the C11? Sometimes, about half the time, I use the uh, 0.7x reducer. Um, but I do like to shoot a 2800 millimeter sometimes as well. But I find that I, I get almost as good a result. Uh, with Tim, you, can stop, you can stop sharing your screen unless that really is you. No, that's, a, that's a Paula Baldwin. <laughs> You can stop sharing your screen so we can just visit. Yeah, sure. Any other questions that I missed, Alex? No, you got that. There was the one question about that. I don't believe I, I was taking notes. There weren't, weren't any other questions. Just a few comments, a few people saying you did a good job, things like that. Uh, uh, Tim, I have a question. Which of the C5s from Moravian, are, do you have the 150 or the? The 100. The 100. Yeah, so it's uh, you can you can use fifty millimeter square filters with it. If you go with the one fifty, you need sixty five millimeter square filters, and holy moly, those are expensive. Um, and I have not found a filter wheel that you can get seven filter seven of those filters into. I know FLI used to make one, but they don't anymore. I, I don't know where you could get one. Uh, I heard you mention that your long go focal length, you were about 0.4 arc seconds per pixel. Do I remember that correctly? Yes. So in that case, you really have to have sub arc second scene to have that a good match. Right. And so, and in that case, you'd probably be better off binning seeing that you're, I don't know what Deep Sky West, but I'm imagining that you have about 1.5 to 2. Normal, correct. normal correct. seeing. That's correct. Um, yeah, Deep Sky West is not a place where you would want to put a CDK 24 or probably anything bigger than a 17. I think 2,800 millimeters is about the limit of what you would want to put there. Um, yeah, again, I don't know, uh, Erica. Is, is there a difference between binning on a CMOS camera and just resampling the data after you've taken it? That's an argument that uh, a lot of people have discussed. Uh, there, There's an argument for taking a bin one and then dance down sampling. Right. Me personally, I take it at bin two and I don't, I've tried the other way and I don't really see any difference. But there's a technical argument that taking it at bin one and down sampling will give you a slightly better result okay I, I, again i um, eric there's been a question in on um 
Isaac wants to know if Tim uses a standard C11 or an Edge version. It's the Edge HD 1100. Thank you. I should tell you, Tim, that I have uh, taken off my sweatshirt so people can see my light Nightfall t-shirt underneath. Oh. So I'm wearing my Nightfall t-shirt. Oh, okay. Well, you mentioned I'm it wearing, a couple times. I'm wearing my Astro Doc T-shirt. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we don't. That, that's yeah, all that's we need. That, yeah, we don't need to see any more, Tim. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> From any of us, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, oh, I show, should I show my T-shirt? My absolutely. Here we got. Uh, this is the life and good. It's it's something to do with astronomy, but I don't know what it is. Is there an <laughs> elk nebula? Is there? I don't know. I've been looking around know. for the for the Mutara nebula. I have been, not been able to find it. Uh, okay. So Are we all set? Do we have any more questions or comments? No. For Jim? We're, we're good. Well, okay, I appreciate Jim. you. I appreciate you guys having me, and I'm very humbled by it. And uh, I hope that someday, and um, I'm, you know, can be one of your peers. So, this this shoot for that forty thousand hours. That's all right. <laughs> That's all right. Well, if we're all set, uh, Patrick, you are uh, running the show. If you can take us out, and we'll see everyone next week. I hope, and we'll talk about kind of semi-manual imaging for the Eclipse, which we're all kind of getting revved. I'm getting revved up for it already. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to happen here at my house. Is it really? Yeah, we get the full we get the full deal here in Dallas. Do you have any extra rooms? I do. <laughs> I do. <laughs> or is it all filled up with astronomy equipment? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. I, I do have extra rooms. So let me know if you want to come stay with us. Uh, we're we're going we're going someplace uh, where there's a fifty percent chance of clouds, but we're crossing all of our fingers and toes. Uh, well, I hope it works out. I hope it works out here. Very good. So, Patrick, take us out, please, everyone. Good night, night. everybody. Good night. Hopefully, Thank we'll you. see you all next week. Take care.